So, so we start. So, um, so we we start the uh, lectures uh, on history and literature on math science. Um, uh, this will be uh, jointly supported by CMSA in Harvard University and YMSC in Tsinghua. And this will be the last talk. We will start again next January. So Peter Kuhlheimer will be the chair. Thank you. So Peter. Thank you, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker in this uh, series. Uh, Nigel Hitchin is a <clears throat> creator of geometry um, from his early seminal work on the Dirac operator through his work on Einstein manifolds and then very prominently his work on the geometry of gauge theory and the geometry of solutions to the self julian mills and Bogomolny equations. Perhaps most prolifically, his work on introduction of Higgs bundles and the two-dimensional self-duality equations have had an enormous influence throughout uh, surprisingly numerous areas of mathematics and, um, and also in physics. Um, throughout his career, there have been moments when he's been very closely associated with the work of Michael Lettier, and there's no better place, no better person, I think, than, than Nigel, um, perhaps no better place than Oxford, where he's from, no better person than Nigel to uh, talk to us today about um, Michael Lettier's work in, and geometry and physics. There'll be, um, the Q&A is open, that's a, the best place to ask questions rather than the chat. Um, and there'll be <coughs> some Q&A, <coughs> excuse me, answers at the end of the talk, um, maybe a few live answers during the talk, but um, do post your questions there as we go along. Thank you, Nigel. Okay, thank you, Peter, for that, uh, for that introduction. Um, so I've got the, the task of uh, trying to explain Michael Atiyah's interaction with uh, physics. He was, uh, well, he was an enthusiast about the interaction. He was a facilitator for it. He was a kind of educator as well, and he was also an active participant. So um, what I'll try and do is to follow things more or less chronologically, and I'll pause at various stages to give an outline of different results on the way. And I, I hope to do it in a rather basic way, which will be suitable for a, for a general audience. So he was a bridge builder. He built bridges between geometry and physics. And I'm on one side of that bridge, so others might, may well have a, a slightly different point of view from my own. But, but anyway, uh, anyway, let's, let's start. So here, here for example, oh, okay, so, okay. So here is, uh, okay, I'm gonna close that. Okay, so here is Sir Michael. Um, this is a, a lecture on monopoles, I think he was given. Um, I don't know that. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Alexa's uh, listening to this, uh, this lecture as well. Um, okay, so um, here's a brief uh, timeline of, uh, his early work. So, of course, by the time he started getting interested in physics in the uh, mid 70s or early 70s, he was already a well established mathematician with a, a, a Fields Medal. So, here is his background that uh, he was uh, a student in Cambridge, undergraduate and graduate. He, um, he was a graduate student at the same time as Roger Penrose. And his first work uh, was in algebraic geometry, studying vector bundles on curves in the early days. So this was kind of relating it to the theory of uh, ruled surfaces. And then he introduced uh, characteristic classes in a holomorphic setting. And then he moved on to topology, uh, K-theory. So with Hertzbruch, he developed uh, K-theory. And then in the early 60s, um, joined with his singer, he developed what was probably at this stage the most important uh, feature of his mathematical work, the Atiyah Singer Index Theorem. And then in 1966, he, he won, won a Fields Medal. So um, I want to begin with the, with the Index Theorem, um, because, um, so in the, as I say, in the 1970s, this was when the interaction with geometry and physics began, but the, the index theorem was somehow a precursor to that interaction. And the, what it meant was that from a certain point of view, 
the same objects could be viewed from the physics perspective and the mathematical perspective. So um, before we start with the index theorem, let me just, uh, so in, later on in life, when he was looking back on the interaction between mathematics and physics, uh, he, uh, he put this down. So he was, this was in his view, the way in which mathematics was uh, learned things or discovered things ahead of physics. There you see a list, fiber bundles, spinners, holonomy, special holonomy. And then uh, the other one, physics ahead of mathematics, infinite dimensional representations, Maxwell theory, supersymmetry, etc. This was, uh, I guess he created this list at a, at a particular stage in the development of the interaction between the two disciplines. But now let me let me get on now and just uh, start, start, talk about the, uh, the index theorem. So I want to start with just the, the basics of what is it? What is the index theorem? And so in a way it's based on the 19th century theorem, uh, well, it's a, which of course is a very special case, but maybe it's, a, it's good to motivate the, uh, the general theorem. So if we have a, a Riemann surface, projective curve of genus G and a holomorphic line bundle over it, of degree D, then <clears throat> the obvious question, if you want to do geometry, is what is the dimension of the space of holomorphic sections of this line bundle? And if the degree D is large, then this is a formula, D plus one minus G. But in general, <clears throat> there's another term, uh, this uh, H1, and it's the difference of these two dimensions, which is uh, d plus one minus g. So we have the difference of two dimensions here. And the right hand side involves two things, d, which is a topological invariant of the line bundle, and g, which is a topological invariant of the Riemann surface. So we can see this in a more uh, analytic perspective if you realize that uh, a holomorphic section is locally given by a holomorphic function, and holomorphic means it satisfies the Cauchy-Riemann equations. And so uh, we, have a, we have df by dz bar is equal to zero. So it turns out that if I take any smooth section of the line bundle, any C infinity section, then this df dz bar dz bar is globally defined as a section of this line bundle L tends to the K bar. So the K bar is where the DZ bar term comes from. So there's a globally defined differential operator going from smooth sections of the line bundle L to sections of L tends to the K bar. And from this point of view, uh, Riemann Roch says that the dimension of the kernel of D bar, which is the space of holomorphic sections, minus the dimension of the co kernel of D bar. So this is one interpretation of that H1. Now this difference of dimensions is D plus one minus G. So this is the possibly the simplest example of the Atiyah Singer index theorem, but it's got the same format. So the index theorem says this, you have a manifold M, a compact manifold, and you have two vector bundles, V plus and V minus, and you have an elliptic operator D going from sections of V plus to sections of V minus. The index is now the, again, the dimension of the kernel of D minus the dimension of the co-kernel of D. And the theorem says that this is given by an explicit polynomial in characteristic classes, which are topological invariants of M, like the genus for the riemann roch theorem, and invariants of V plus and V minus, like the degree or the first churn class. So these are more general, the higher dimensional invariants, and they occur in a particular form as a polynomial. So that's the, that's the index theorem. And uh, uh, a key example, which was really a motivating example, when Atiyah and Singer got together in the uh, early 60s, uh, the Dirac operator was the, uh, the elliptic operator which started the whole, the whole thing off. And so there's an obvious question there, wasn't this the time in which physics and geometry came together? 
And uh, Atiyah really, uh, he was asked this question uh, much later on. So here's what his, uh, his view was. Um, so as you see, um, I think two key points are that Minkowski space and not uh, Riemannian manifold. So the difference in signature in the, uh, the metric made a difference. And um, as he points out, Hodge and Dirac were both professors at the same time in Cambridge. And in fact, Hodge was well aware that his uh, theory of harmonic forms was related to Maxwell's equation. But uh, as uh, Tia points out, it perhaps never occurred to Hodge to use the Dirac operator. And it's quite convincing to say that the, uh, the mysterious nature of spinners perhaps had something, something to do with that. Um, after all, actually, if you look at Hodge's uh, book in the 1930s, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that, uh, explaining what a manifold is and what a differential form is. So to expect that something as sophisticated as a spinner could be incorporated into that picture at the time was perhaps uh, too much to hope for. Anyway, uh, anyway, the proofs of the uh, index theorem began in the 1960s and uh, there are various proofs but um, I think the most successful ones were based on algebraic geometry. They were modeled on the Riemann-Roch theorem uh, including Grothendieck's version of the Riemann-Roch theorem, a much bigger extension than the, uh, the simple one that I just, I just mentioned. And in some ways the, uh, the focus of course was always on the the dimension of the kernel of your elliptic operator, the space of holomorphic sections or uh, sheaf cohomology groups associated to uh, uh, an algebraic variety. So although there was a differential operator there, it was always a question of looking at the, uh, the kernel, whereas physicists, of course, were interested in the, the whole spectrum of an operator. And I think this is perhaps one of the essential differences. And, Later, in the 19, early 1970s, when Patodi came along, uh, I think then began a view of the index theorem, which was more receptive uh, to, uh, to physicists. So Patodi's uh, approach was to use the, the heat kernel. So uh, D star D, you take the adjoint, the formal adjoint of the operator D, and uh, D star D, has, uh, is a non-negative operator, it has uh, self-adjoint, it has a real spectrum, and so the heat kernel is this uh, the sum here, uh, the, well, the trace of the heat kernel is this, this, this sum of uh, using eigenvalues. And um, when you look at the, the operator D, which could have been the Dirac operator, then the co-kernel is now we can think of that as the isomorphic to the kernel of the adjoint. And also the kernel of D is the same as the kernel of D star D because D star D is uh, non-negative. Similarly, the co-kernel of D is the kernel of D D star. And so the eigenspaces for non-zero eigenvalues of both these operators are interchanged by D. So from that point of view, the index is the difference of the trace of the, of the heat kernels. Trace of it, the, because the, the contributions from the non-zero eigenvalues uh, cancel and uh, the zero eigenvalue just gives you the, the dimension. So the method of proof is to know that there's an expansion of these as t tends to zero, an asymptotic expansion as an integral of local curvature terms and then comes the challenge of uh, manipulating these into the expressions which occur on the right-hand side of the, of the index theorem. But at this, so, so at this point, this was a, a new point of view of the index theorem, and it brought in the, the spectrum. Uh, but it also brought in a, a point of view of the of physicists, and that is that, um, there are different words to apply to this situation. So V plus and V minus uh, for the Dirac operator, these uh, in physicist terms are called uh, opposite 
these have opposite chirality. And the symmetry between the non-zero part of the spectrum of the two operators is something which doesn't extend to the zero eigenspace. So this is a this is an anomaly. This is uh, so we have this symmetry which is broken, and so the word so this is a chiral anom anomaly. So the the index here acquires a different interpretation in terms of the chiral anomaly in physicist language. Well, what Patodi's uh, approach also gave was uh, a way of looking at spectral asymmetry, the same kind of asymmetry for uh, in odd dimensions. So for the, the Dirac operator in suitable odd dimensions has a, a real spectrum. Uh, it's a first order operator, there is positive and negative spectrum. And the lack of symmetry is measured by this, uh, this eta invariant. Uh, well, so this expression here has an analytic continuation to s equals zero, and that is the eta invariant. And that in subsequent uh, physics uh, uh, literature, it occurs as what's called the global anomaly. For example, when you have the diffeomorphism of a manifold X, then this expression for the mapping torus uh, involves, the, uh, involves the, eta, the eta invariant. So I think from this point of view, there's a, there's a kind of a, a common point of view, different, slightly different language on the same sort of thing when we come to the later developments in, in index theory. But this, uh, this is not really the beginning of the interaction of Atiyah with, with physics. And that, that occurred uh, a little bit later in, uh, in the area of twister theory. So, um, so here, so who is this? This is Roger Penrose. And uh, what I've got here is a uh, beginnings of his paper in 1966 on Twister algebra. So uh, I remember I was uh, Atiyah's assistant at the Institute for Advanced Study in the early 70s. And at the time, in fact, that Patodi was there. And um, one day, maybe it was in 72, 72, uh, Atiyah said, look, Roger Penrose is giving a talk in the university. Let's go and uh, listen to it. So the talk was uh, probably about singularity theorems, uh, black holes, things like that. But after the talk, uh, I noticed that, um, that the two of them got together and were talking. I wondered whether they perhaps uh, reflecting on their times as a student together, but uh, it, it turned out that they're actually both going to go, go to Oxford, that uh, Atia was uh, leaving the Institute to go to, to Oxford and uh, Penrose had been just been appointed to the, uh, the chair, the Rouseball professorship in, in Oxford. So they were both going back to Oxford and I don't know, maybe they were comparing salaries for all I know. But anyway, they, they, were, they were both from 1972 or onwards, probably, they were both, uh, both in Oxford. And uh, it was there that Penrose gathered around him uh, a school of postdocs and students uh, working on, the, on Twister theory. So let me, uh, let me try and explain what Twister theory does. So in Penrose's language, he well okay so it's based on a piece of classical algebraic geometry which uh, both Penrose and Atiyah I'm sure knew even as undergraduates is the correspondence between projective lines in projective three space and points in the in a quadric in a four-dimensional projective quadric so this is all over the complex numbers um and from Penrose's point of view, this four-dimensional quadric is uh, complexified, compactified Minkowski space. Well, it's a little bit easier to describe that actually if you don't compactify. So if you, if you remove a line from P3, then <clears throat> what remains is, so if you can, you can project onto a, a skew line and that's effectively describing the complement of the P1 and P3 as a vector bundle, a rank two vector bundle over the projective line. In fact, it's the, it's the sum of two line bundles 
the line bundles of degree, line bundle of degree one. So, so this is the, and this, so then what is a projective line in this part, a line that doesn't meet this P1, this line at infinity, it's, uh, it's a line in this uh, vector bundle which projects uh, isomorphically onto the base, so it's a section. So we can write it in another way. We can say that uh, so a section of the line bundle O1, the holomorphic section, is given by a linear function in a, a coordinate, in a single coordinate, the, an affine coordinate on P1. And so the lines are parameterized here. We can write them as AZ plus B, C zeta plus D. So it's parameterized, parameterized by a four-dimensional space, the coefficients A, B, C, D. So this is supposed to be complexified Minkowski space, but why, why Minkowski space? Why not just a, a vector space? And that's because there's a, a light cone. So the, the light cone through a point is defined by the lines that meet a fixed line. So in the twister correspondence, a point in Minkowski space is a line in the twister space if we look at the, the lines that meet a fixed one, then that is the, the null cone. How does it work? Well, suppose we take the, the zero section of this rank two vector bundle, then we're looking for sections which intersect the zero section. So for some value of zeta, uh, both of these terms must vanish. And what's the condition that that should happen? That, uh, that this uh, quadric expression is equal to zero. And if you put in uh, some real coordinates, x, y, z, t, like this, then you'll see that the light cone uh, turns out to be just the usual light cone in Minkowski space. So if, so you re, uh, you, you obtain a vector space with a light cone, a uh, family of light cones, conformal structure, by looking at the projective lines in a three-dimensional uh, complex manifold. That's the key to, to twister theory. So actually, if you look at the, uh, maybe you can't read this, but right at the bottom, it says the general twister description of physical fields is left to a later paper. Well, uh, so the later paper was about uh, zero rest mass field equations. So these are equations like, uh, the wave equation, the Dirac equation, Maxwell's equations, they're all conformally invariant and they all admit of a description in twister theory by contour integrals. So this was the point at which uh, I think uh, Penrose and Atiyah first came mathematically together to discuss some common ground. So this is, this is the way that uh, Penrose described the process. So um, I don't know whether you can read this, but uh, so you start with a, a twister function. So that's a holomorphic function of three variables. And uh, what do you do with it? So you want it to be holomorphic in some domain of twister space, so not everywhere. And you're allowed to modify it. You're allowed to add on uh, holomorphic in some other domain and something which is in another domain. There's some pictures here to tell you what to do. And then there are about two more conditions uh, further down. So Penrose uh, came to Atiyah's, maybe it was the common room or maybe in Atiyah's office and said, What's, what is this all about? And uh, Atiyah pointed out that this is actually the same thing as uh, looking at a sheaf cohomology group, an H1 of a line bundle on twister space. And in fact, the case where L is the line bundle O minus two, pulled back from, uh, from P1, then this gave uh, the wave equation. So, so how did this work? Well, so this would be Penrose's point of view would be this, that you take a holomorphic function of three variables and then you make this, this substitution. You put uh, Z1 equal to this expression, Z2 equal to this, and then there's zeta. So now it's a function. So for each X, Y, Z, T, you have a function of zeta. You do a contour integral and then it's easy to see that what you get is a solution to, uh, to the wave equation. Of course, it might be zero because this holomorphic function might extend to the interior of the contour or to the exterior. And so that's the, uh, the issue with the ambiguity, which, um, which Penrose was describing in a, 
a long and complicated fashion. So, but the Atia point of view would say this, that here we have a twist of space, Z, this complex manifold. Let's, uh, let's decompose the projective line into two copies of the complex numbers, remove the point at infinity and the point uh, zero. And then the twist of the space itself falls apart into two copies of C3, which are patched together over C2 cross C star. And so you would say if you take a, a holomorphic function of three variables thought of as a holomorphic function on this intersection, then that is a, a check representative for a sheaf cohomology class in, in this H1. So that, that data, the function of three variables, gives you a class in this uh, cohomology group. And then you want to know what it's, uh, how it becomes a scalar field in Minkowski space. So you, you take a point in space time, you look at the corresponding projective line, which is given by this expression, as we saw before, then you restrict this cohomology group to this. And this is one dimensional on the projective line, that's Riemann Roch. And so what you get is a scalar field phi. So uh, the actual um, technology of sheave cohomology was able to be applied to this, uh, this, this particular question. And indeed, uh, Penrose's students very quickly latched onto it and were using uh, spectral sequences and all the, all the apparatus of uh, chief cohomology theory to advance the subject in that direction. So uh, this was a common ground between uh, Penrose's physics and uh, Atiyah's uh, knowledge of algebraic geometry. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's this question, there were further questions which came out of this. One was that, okay, so this complex vector space C4 was Minkowski space, but it was complexified Minkowski space. So there was some complex conjugation on C4 whose real points are Minkowski space. That translated in, in the relativistic situation to having two dual projective spaces related by complex conjugation. But Atiyah started looking at uh, Euclid the Euclidean uh, space. So the positive definite metric, which obviously once you complexify, you can't really see the difference between that and Minkowski space. And in this case, the, uh, the real structure, there was a real structure on the same projective three space, complex projective three space. It was a real, so this is a real anti-holomorphic involution, but with no real points. So you can think of it as the having a quaternionic structure on the underlying four-dimensional complex vector space of which this is the projective space. And from this point of view, um, the complex manifold here was seen as a vibration over the four sphere whose fibers are the projective lines, complex projective lines inside P3, which are invariant under the real structure, under the involution. So this was a this was a an offshoot of Penrose's twister theory, which became uh, meant that Euclidean space um, could be seen in the in the same context that um, Euclidean space and Minkowski space have the same complexification here, but the technology of twister theory could be applied in the Euclidean situation as well. So this really came about at the time of uh, when. Uh, a more serious question arising from physics uh, landed on uh, Atiyah's desk. Uh, and this, is, uh, this was the, the question of instantons. So it was really uh, Singer, is Singer who brought this question to Oxford in around 1977, I think it was. Uh, so I was there at the time and uh, very much involved with this. So he brought uh, a question which uh, was new to us as differential geometers. Um, so you're looking for a, a connection, uh, for simplicity, a uh, connection, SU2 connection. So over Euclidean four space. So the connection is given by 
covariant derivatives, differential operators like this, where the AI is a, uh, it takes values in the Lie algebra of SU2, so it's a, a function which is a skewer joint matrix. And then the curvature, the natural curvature, the natural variant of a connection is given by the commutator of these. It's a two form with values in the Lie algebra. And you can look at its norm squared, uh, which in fact is, turns out to be conformally variant. But anyway, the integral, we assume that the, the curvature decays suitably at infinity, that this is well defined. And then the question was, what are the actual minima of this? And the, the minima are known as the, so these satisfy an algebraic equation that self self dual solutions, the ones for which half the curvature vanishes essentially. Uh, so while this question was doing the rounds in Oxford, uh, Singer spent a whole term explaining the issues. Uh, Richard Ward, who was a student of uh, Roger Penrose at the time, he observed that actually, if you're looking at complex self-dual connections, then the twister correspondence worked there, that these were equivalent to holomorphic vector bundles on, on twister space. So here was another natural connection. It wasn't just that uh, sheaf cohomology groups corresponded to solutions to the zero rest mass field equations, but that some nonlinear equations, these self dual Young Mills equations are nonlinear, that these corresponded to uh, natural holomorphic objects on, on uh, projective space. So the particular issue, the particular boundary conditions uh, were, for, in, in this case, not just for complex self dual solutions, were that you could use conformal invariance and that. Uh, if you assumed appropriate properties of the, of the curvature at infinity, which were later uh, validated by Karen Ullenbeck, then you could put this as a problem on the four sphere instead of the uh, Euclidean space, R4. And then it turned out that an instanton was uh, a solution to these self dual uh, Young Mills equations was equivalent to a holomorphic uh, vector bundle on P3. Which, was, uh, which is trivial on each real line. So being trivial on each real line, you see immediately how you get a, a vector bundle on the four sphere, but uh, it, it becomes a vector bundle with connection and that connection is, uh, is self-dual. So the problem at the time was to, was to find uh, all solutions of the self-dual Young-Mills equations. There's a topological invariant, the charge K, uh, so for fixed charge K, you want to find uh, all solutions. This was at least the problem that was posed by the physicists. Well, the final answer uh, I won't talk about because in fact, Simon Donaldson uh, gave a talk about this in this series of lectures in uh, earlier this year. It's what's called the ADHM construction. So that's Atia, Drinfeld, myself and Manin. And it's uh, the final answer involves basically linear algebra, which in our formulation were quaternionic matrices, which satisfy certain quadratic constraints. But what I want to talk about uh, now is, uh, is actually what happened a little bit before that. Uh, and this is, um, this is really Atia and Ward. How did they get together to try and use algebraic geometry to solve these equations. Well, in the first instance, and this is something which we mathematicians always value from physicists that uh, explicit solutions. So, so physicists are always very good at producing explicit solutions, much better than mathematicians. And uh, the only thing that uh, then mathematicians sometimes complain that physicists only produce uh, examples, but uh, you can't get going without examples. And these were the these were the standard examples at the beginning of this whole picture of uh, instantons. So there's a, a substitution there that so you have a, a one over you have a potential one over r squared potential, which is the fundamental solution to the Laplace equation in four dimensions, and you have various points uh, at different points uh, x i's in r four. 
And you have this function here. So this is a linear combination of these one over r squared potentials based on points in R4. And there's a substitution. I don't really want to explain the, the, what this is, but it's a way in which you incorporate this function into uh, an expression for the, the connection. And these, uh, so these were called pseudo particles uh, because for, for clear reasons that they somehow the parameters are points in, in R4. So those, those solutions were, were there, but uh, in fact, it was a, a use of the index theorem, which showed that in fact, there weren't enough. This gave up the maximum 5K plus four solutions, and the index theorem gave 8K minus three, which meant that one needed to look further. And that's what ended up with the ADHM construction. But <clears throat> so, but how did uh, Atiyah and Ward uh, look at this? They said, well, in algebraic geometric terms, what can we do to construct uh, holomorphic vector bundles on P3? What's the simplest thing? And there's a, so there's an analogy here. So suppose you want to look at a line bundle, a holomorphic line bundle on Riemann surface. So this is all one dimensional. Suppose you have a section of that line bundle, then it's going to vanish at points x1 up to xd, where d is the degree of the line bundle. Then what do you have? So outside of those points, you have a non-vanishing section, which means that the line bundle is trivial outside the points. And on disks, little disks around those points, you have another trivialization. That's just the definition of a line bundle. They are line bundles are trivial over uh, uh, neighborhoods of any point. And so if you now have local coordinates around these uh, points, x1 to xd, then they count as, uh, as uh, transition functions. You can patch together these two trivializations and re recover the line bundle. So the line bundle you re can recover in, uh, in one dimension on a Riemann surface by the set of points uh, given by a, uh, the zeros of a, of a section. So can you do the same for rank two bundles over P3? So if you suppose that a rank two bundle has a section S, then locally it's given by the vanishing of, uh, so the zero set is locally given by the vanishing of two functions. So it's a curve. And now in the complement of this curve, you don't have a trivialization of the rank two bundle, but you do have a trivial sub bundle. You have a non-vanishing section. And the non-vanishing section means that you have a sub bundle, a trivial sub bundle and a quotient bundle L. So this means that, uh, over overlapping open sets, the transition matrix can be reduced to this form. And this upper triangular part here is naturally, the way it transforms, when you multiply these together, it transforms as an element of this sheaf cohomology group here. And of course, uh, what happens on the curve C? Well, what you get is uh, a class in the x1 of the ideal sheaf of the curve C with values in this line bundle here. So this is what's called the, the SER construction of rank two uh, holomorphic bundles. Not every bundle uh, you can do this to but in particular, but on P3, if you twist enough times uh, by a, a line bundle of positive degree, you will get a section and you can start to apply this. And this was the, the method that uh, Atiyah and Ward began to use. Um, so uh, suppose then you have the situation where this line bundle, this quotient bundle here was isomorphic to O2, then what is this? this? This expression here is now one of the things which gives you a solution to Laplace's equation, or well, the wave equation for Minkowski space, but Laplace's equation for Euclidean space. And so actually, if you, if you now take a curve to be a disjoint union of K real lines, then this solution uh, doesn't extend, but it has a one over r squared singularity at the k points, and you recover, you recover these uh, these so-called Toft solutions, which were the, the first ones that came from uh, from the physicists. So, so there was this link here between the algebraic geometry of the Serre construction, lines and curves in projective space, and these particular solutions. And this was a a line of attack, which they followed uh, a little by uh, twisting again and getting more complicated curves, but it's, uh, it gradually increased the degrees of freedom, but uh, 
but it wasn't a very uh, uniform way of doing things. And so ultimately the ADHM construction came in and made things much more, much more uniform. But this is, this is a point which I, I want to come back to later, that these pseudo particle solutions do, do play a role in this, in this picture. Okay, so after this uh, particular collaboration, if you like, or this interaction, um, well, this was one of the ways in which uh, Michael thought of geometry and physics. I'm not saying that it's the only way in which he thinks that they should react, but this was an example of what he called the, the market force model that we mathematicians alter our production in the light of the changing needs of physics. So we were given a problem by the physicists and the challenge there was to find out of our uh, toolbox of techniques, uh, a way of, way of uh, solving it. Um, but the, the influence went the other way. Uh, so that um, in particular, the gauge theory became then uh, a topic in, in geometry, in differential geometry, in mathematics, in algebraic geometry. And looking back on it, one wonders why. I mean, connections were familiar objects to any differential geometer. Uh, but what was the difference? Why, was, why, was it, why did the physicists look at connections in a different way? And I think the point was that perhaps that uh, differential geometers were previously interested in, in individual connections and not in whole families of them. In particular, this instant on problem involved looking at the infinite dimensional space of all connections on a vector bundle, this infinite dimensional group of automorphisms, the group of gauge transformations, and inside the space of all connections uh, was this space of solutions to self dual young mills equations. And what one wanted was a a way of finding uh, points in this finite dimensional moduli space, the space of equivalence classes of all solutions, modulo gauge equivalence. I think this particular aspect was, uh, was something new. Somehow these big spaces of, uh, of connections and the, divide, the idea of dividing out by the action of an infinite dimensional group of transformations was a, well, it wasn't entirely new because the study of the moduli of complex surfaces or complex algebraic varieties had the same, uh, some of the same techniques involved, but it was a relatively new aspect of connections. And of course, what it led to was, uh, was a study of the moduli spaces and the question of what, uh, what did these moduli spaces look like? And the first one was uh, charge one. So when it was easy to work out the dimension of this was five, five dimensions that the group of conformal transformations acts on this. And there's only one alternative that it has to be hyperbolic space. And was, it was determined as the, uh, the each point here was represented by the uh, connection given by the levi civic to connection on the, the spin bundle of a, in, for a con constant curvature metric within the conformal class. And the, uh, okay, just as an aside, the, the boundary of this hyperbolic space is, of course, the original space, the four sphere itself. And people have asked me in the past uh, in, that, so why was it that, uh, that you didn't realize that this was important, that the boundary of this charge one monopole moduli space was the original, the original manifold? And uh, I guess we observed it, but, uh, it took Simon Donaldson to realize what the uh, the implications of that would be for for other other manifolds in the four sphere. Anyway, that's that's another story. So what I want to talk about now is the uh, the way in which uh, gauge theory actually came into mathematics, uh, and in particular, in this this paper, this collaboration between Michael Latier and Raoul Bott which I think brought, uh, brought out a, a lot of features which uh, developed in different areas uh, later on. So this was an application of the idea of finding the 
minima of the Yang mills functional, but not in four dimensions, but in two dimensions. So you're on a compact surface, a compact Riemann surface, uh, and uh, you're looking at the space of connections on a fixed C infinity vector bundle. You have the Yang mills functional, norm squared of the curvature, same sort of Yang mills function as we had in the instanton problem. And the, in this case, the absolute minimum is given by the, uh, by the vanishing of the curvature, flat connections. Well, that's, of course, on the four sphere, that's a possibility, but a flat connection on the four sphere is completely trivial, whereas on a non-compact, on a compact Riemann surface, which, has, which is not simply connected, uh, it gives you a flat connection, which is determined by uh, the holonomy, which is the representation of the fundamental group into the unitary group. So the moduli space, uh, we have a, an expression for it. It's the space of homomorphisms of a suitable type from the fundamental group into UN modulo the conjugation action of UN. So here the problem is not so much to find the minima, but to find the topology of this, uh, of this moduli space. And so uh, the idea of uh, Atiyah and Bach was to try and use Morse theory. So Morse, Morse theory in its classical setting is uh, of course uh, where you're given a manifold and a function on it and you look at the minimum of the function and every time you get to a critical point you add a handle, you change the topology of the surface as you as you take level sets and go further and further up, not just the surface, a manifold in general. Every time you reach a critical point, you have a, a contribution to the topology until finally you build up um, the homotopy type of M, hopefully, uh, by looking at these, uh, these uh, critical submanifolds. So their idea was to do this in an infinite dimensional context, uh, to look at the the manifold, replace the manifold by the, the space of uh, connections modulo gauge equivalence and replace the function by the Yang Mills functional. And then it wasn't so much to find the topology of M itself, which was, which is known space of basically the space of all connections. Well, space of all connections is of course contractible, but the space modulo the um, gauge group is, uh, is related to maps from uh, the surface into the classifying space of, of uh, UN. The idea is then to, uh, to look at the, the topology of the critical submanifolds and subtract in order to get the, the Betty numbers of the absolute minimum, which is uh, more complicated. So the idea is that the critical submanifolds, uh, the not the absolute minima, correspond to the case where the curvature is covariant constant. And that means that the, the vector bundle breaks up as a direct sum of smaller vector bundles. And then the hope is to use induction to determine the contributions from these other critical submanifolds. And then by subtraction to get a formula for the, for the Betty numbers which of the absolute minimum, which is where the curvature is zero. And this is this uh, space of representations. So there are uh, a lot of difficulties. The Morse theory didn't work as nice as it did in finite dimensions, nor as nice as it did in the sort of situation that Bott himself had used with uh, loop spaces. But, uh, but the more important thing, I think, and in fact, at the end, uh, they, they found the formulas, uh, formulas which were already known because of work of Harder and Nara Simhan using a number theoretic method. But I think the importance of this paper is, uh, is less in the determination of these Betty numbers and more in terms of the kind of spin-off into, into other areas. And so uh, and let me go through these. So I think, first of all, <clears throat> there's this different viewpoint on holomorphic structures, so on a vector bundle. So the traditional viewpoint is, of course, that you have open sets on which the vector bundle is trivial, and you relate them on twofold intersections by a transition matrix, a holomorphic function, 
from the twofold intersection into general linear group. So you replace that instead by a D bar operator. Well, we've met that earlier. But the point here is that actually, if you have in two dimensions, if you have any connection, then the, that gives you a differentiation in all directions, but the differentiation in the, direct, in the Z bar direction is actually a D bar operator. So you can think instead of the space of connections, you can think of that same space as being the space of holomorphic structures. Now, as such, it's not just it, it becomes a, an infinite dimensional complex manifold. So holomorphic structures are defined by, by complex structures here <clears throat> when we have a, a complex structure in the Riemann surface. The second are the symplectic aspects of the, <clears throat> these connections in two dimensions. <clears throat> so this uh, space of all connections on a vector bundle with a unitary structure. This is an infinite dimensional affine space. Uh, the difference of two connections is a one form with values in the Lie algebra. And so any two tangent vectors are given by such an object. And we take the trace of a dot which b dot and integrate over sigma. This is a, a skew form, which is a, a symplectic form, a for, formally speaking, a symplectic form. And then what uh, T.M. Bott uh, noticed was that uh, the group, the action of the group of gauge transformations gave, uh, uh, had a moment map, which was essentially the, the curvature. So the moment map maps into, it's an equivariant map into the dual of the Lie algebra. In this case, you can think of the Lie algebra is the space of C infinity sections of the Lie algebra bundle, integrating the two form against such a thing, uh, it's, uh, it gives you a, an evaluation. And uh, so in that respect, the, the curvature is the value of the, the moment map. And so, so then this moduli space, you're looking at the zero set of the moment map, that's the space of flat connections, modulo the group of gauge transformations, this is a, this is a symplectic quotient. So this moduli space has a, a natural symplectic structure the so-called reduced phase space or marsden weinstein quotient. So uh, symplectic aspects came out of this. Another more technical issue arose uh, when, well, if you try and apply Morse theory, then there's a, a partial ordering on the critical submanifolds given by the, the gradient flow, the downward gradient flow. So you, you look at the trajectories of the gradient flow, and you'd say that uh, there's a partial ordering on these critical submanifolds uh, if there's a tra trajectory starting on one and ending, well, not necessarily, ending with an epsilon of the, of the other one. So in trying to put together the induction, they, they were, they've had critical submanifolds, which were given by direct sums of uh, flat connections. So you had, integers given n1 up to nk given by the ranks of these factors, degrees d1 up to dk. And so there was some ordering required on this, uh, this sets of integers, the n's and d's. And uh, the ordering, so in fact, they replaced, they had to replace the gradient flow stratification by another one coming from algebraic geometry. But uh, by looking at the uh, stratification introduced by Schatz, they noticed that the most convenient way of uh, looking at this stratification was the ordering was in terms of the convexity of a, a polygon. As a consequence of that, they, uh, they realized that uh, actually in, uh, there, was a, there was another way of looking at this thing in a much more general context. And uh, this is all to do with the <coughs> convexity of the, uh, the image of the moment map under, under a torus action. So it led on to another aspect of symplectic geometry by solving some technical problem within the, uh, within the proof. There was another aspect of this, <clears throat> which was the relationship with the Narasimhan-Sashadri theorem. So here, Narasimhan-Sashadri showed that a holomorphic vector bundle on a compact Riemann surface is stable if and only if it admits a flat unitary connection. 
So stability here is that if you look at the, the slope, the degree of uh, uh, divided by the rank, then if the degree of a subbundle, if the slope of the subbundle was less than the slope of the bundle, then that was that's what stability imply, means. And what they showed was that uh, if this if this situation is satisfied, then uh, then there exists a flat unitary connection. So within the context of what Atier and Pot were doing, A was a space of holomorphic structures. You have a complex gauge transformations. Then if you look at the space, the open set of stable holomorphic structures, then Narasimha and Sashadri said that every orbit under complex gauge transformations in the stable set meets the zero set of the moment map, the flat connections in a point. And so actually this quotient is, uh, this symplectic space is actually the, the quotient of the space of stable bundles by the uh, <coughs> complex automorphisms. So it doesn't give a, a proof of the Narasim and Sashadri theorem, but it, it gave a setting for it within this infinite dimensional context. And what it suggested was that a solution of a differential equation, namely a flat connection, <coughs> could analytically be related to uh, the st stability. And this gave rise, of course, to uh, many more aspects of this in uh, different contexts, in particular the Donaldson, Nuremberg, Yao theorems about stability in, in higher, higher dimensions, higher rank. So and finally, there was there's the question about looking at algebraic geometric quotients that uh, Atia and Bach were looking at the minimum of the Young-Mills functional on a an orbit of the uh, group of complex gauge transformations. In finite dimensions, you have a similar situation with the the result of Kempf and Ness. Atia and Bach used equivariant Morse theory to compute the cohomology of the quotient, the symplectic quotient, which was the same thing uh, by Narasim and Sashadri as the, uh, as the moduli space uh, of stable bundles. And Frances Kerwin, who was a student of uh, Atier at the same time, she used this idea. So instead of looking at the norm squared of the Young Mills functional in finite dimensions, you look at the norm squared of the moment map for an action of the unitary group and <coughs> dis, uh, <coughs> described how to get uh, and the cohomology of the uh, moduli space by using equivariant uh, cohomology, equivariant Morse theory. So these, these, these spin-offs were uh, possibly more valuable than the result itself from this, this, uh, co this collaboration. So, so what happened when then was this was the introduction of a, an idea from gauge theory, uh, the looking for the minimum of the young mills functional into a mathematical problem which led to many more mathematical problems coming out from issues which arose in actually solving the, the question. Okay, so, uh, so that was a, a situation of an idea, gauge theory, a whole area of physics coming into mathematics. Um, what about going in the other direction? So here I think is where <clears throat> the role of Ed Witten uh, comes into play. So here is uh, Edward Witten's first paper, I think. He was looking at uh, solutions to self julian mills equations, um, which were invariant under SO3. And I think this initially was the uh, meeting point between uh, Atia and Witten, but uh, they went on to uh, uh, exchange ideas uh, uh, for, for many, many years. So um, Atiyah's role here was um, twofold. Uh, one of them was issuing challenges to the physicists. Um, here are some examples. So uh, very early on, I think uh, Atiyah noticed that uh, the duality, Langdon's duality of uh, groups, so this was uh, mentioned to him by uh, Goddard and Montanan and Olive, that there should be some relationship between Langren's duality and the electric magnetic charges. I think early on, uh, Atia uh, suggested to Witten that there must be something going on there, which I think took a long time before it, uh, it was realized. 
he also suggested the uh, floor theory is, uh, as, a, as should be a Hamiltonian formulation of a quantum field theory. And uh, most importantly, perhaps the, uh, the, the challenge of uh, having a quantum field theory to describe the Jones polynomial. Now, <coughs> Whitson has already talked about this in this series of lectures. So, uh, so that's a good reference point to learn uh, what happened there. So this is one way in which uh, Michael interacted with the physics uh, community by largely through Witten by issuing challenges. Another one was, uh, if you like, was uh, education. Um, so as Witten has said, uh, so early on, I think Atia and Bot gave some lectures uh, at a physics conference in Cargez. And uh, so he introduced Morse theory to them, as you see. So when was saying that he'd never been exposed to Morse theory before. And so there was this, this question about index theory. Uh, how did that relate to perturbative anomalies? Equivariant cohomology and localization, which had been used uh, quite considerably in mathematics, was introduced to the physicists as a, in fact, as a very useful uh, uh, way of, uh, of computing expressions. Um, so there, this was a kind of uh, a twofold interaction. One was explaining mathematical things to physicists, and another was uh, trying to challenge the physicists to produce a theory which would explain, if you like, or put in a different context, some results in mathematics. So let me just mention uh, briefly uh, the Morse theory, because uh, this was the, so this is the way that Witten looked at Morse theory. So we have, I've, I've discussed, if you like, the traditional way of taking a manifold and a function and looking at the uh, critical points. And here, well, here for Witten, you look at the odd differential forms on the manifold. The odd ones you regard as fermionic states and the even ones as bosonic states. And then the exterior derivative and its adjoint and this is a supersymmetry operator. It's going from odd to even, even to odd. It's exchanging fermions and bosons. And there's another one, Q2. H, Q1 squared equals Q2 squared equals H. These are supersymmetry relations. So I think, uh, if you like, to paraphrase Goethe, uh, whatever you say to a physicist, they translate it into their own language and forthwith it is something entirely different. So this was this was Morse theory in Witten's, uh, from Witten's viewpoint, it's a question of supersymmetry. So uh, the Betty numbers are going to be realized in this case uh, via space of harmonic forms, degree P, uh, and how is it going to come about? How are we going to introduce the function? So the function is introduced by conjugating the operator d and d star by e to the ft. So it doesn't make any difference to the, uh, the cohomology. We, we've still got d squared equals zero. We just, everything is being conjugated. Uh, but it does make a difference to this uh, d d star plus d star d, which is the, the usual uh, Laplacian, uh, Hodge Laplacian, plus a term uh, like this. So it involves a derivative term here and the second derivative of the function f here. So this is like the, this is the Laplacian plus the, a potential. And the idea is that as t goes to infinity, and then the potential gets very large, except at the critical points, so the, where the t squared is, uh, is suppressed. And uh, as a result of experience with potentials, uh, uh, the eigenfunctions of this, uh, this operator are seen to be concentrated near the, the critical points. So you have local expressions in terms of the critical points. So the, uh, the role of the second order part here uh, is to look at the negative eigenvalues of this, of the Hessian, which is in topological terms, the, so in Morse theoretic terms, it's called the index the number of negative eigenvalues of the Hessian, uh, that plus the asymptotic expansion of the eigenvalues gives an estimate for the, uh, 
the number of uh, critical points in terms of the uh, zero eigenvalues of the of the ordinary uh, Laplacian, Hodge Laplacian. So those are the first of the Morse uh, inequalities. And the other, the stronger Morse inequalities require the consideration of the, the gradient flows from one critical point to another, which in the physicist language became uh, instant ton tunneling, tunneling between different states, a different language. There's a different language <clears throat> for something which uh, had been considered before. So this so-called Witten complex was really a, a revival of the, uh, of the work of Morse, Mayle, Tom and Milner, but from a very different perspective. And so this was, this was quite, uh, quite influential in many, many different uh, contexts. And not only that, but also it, it's a method which could be applied not just to D plus D star, but to the, the D bar operator on a, a Kähler manifold where one got obtained holomorphic analogs of these, Morse inequalities for holomorphic cohomology. So that was a, a way in which <clears throat> Morse theory was being interpreted uh, in, in terms of supersymmetry. Um, what about backwards flow from physics to mathematics? Well, here, the most uh, obvious uh, case, something which is, of course, of great current interest, is uh, topological quantum field theories. So here, these... I guess originated with the work of Witten, Moore, and Zyberg, but it was uh, <clears throat> the final form was uh, very much influenced by uh, a paper of Graham Siegel on the definition of conformal field theory. And uh, now, but nowadays, what we have are uh, what are known as Atiyah's axioms. I think it's probably uncharacteristic of uh, Michael Atiyah to to actually resort to axioms, but uh, in this case, it was a question of uh, giving structure to something which, uh, which was there with various examples. So this may be familiar to a number of uh, people watching here. So if you associate to a compact oriented manifold of dimension D, a vector space, Z sigma, and if you have a, a manifold of one dimension higher, whose boundary is sigma, then you associate a, a vector, Zm in Z sigma, which satisfies these uh, conditions, that is functorial with respect to diffeomorphisms, that if you change the orientation, then, uh, then you get the dual space. The disjoint union is the tensor product for the, the empty, <clears throat> the, the empty boundary is a, a vector space, which is C. The empty interior M gives you one in C and then change the orientation of the, of the D plus one manifold and you get the conjugate complex uh, structure. So for a, a mathematician or somebody working in uh, cohomology, uh, it's the tensor product is the, is the unusual aspect. And somehow this is the, this is the quantum nature of these, these invariants. And of course, this was uh, very influential. And uh, whenever you see these axioms, you usually see these uh, pictures. And so this three manifold, this, sorry, this is, so now we're working in one, if D is equal to one. So if we look at the uh, Z of a circle, so circles are all, there's only one up to diffeomorphism, there's only one uh, compact uh, connected uh, one manifold, which is a circle. So there should be a, a vector space associated to the circle. Uh, this picture gives you a vector in the tensor product of the duals of two of them with the, uh, with, uh, the other one, which is the same thing as a, as a product. This picture gives you a trace. And so this data gives you a Frobenius algebra. So uh, an algebra with a trace. As an example of that is the character ring of a finite group where the product is the convolution and the trace is evaluation of the identity normalized by <coughs> the, <coughs> the um, degree of the group. Uh, and if you pass from a finite group to a compact D group, then 
uh, then you can, okay, formally speaking, you can do the same sort of thing with the character ring of the of a Lie algebra. And then for a closed surface, uh, you get a, a, a number, which is, uh, so according to the, uh, the work of Witten, what you get is the, is the volume of the moduli space of, uh, of flat G connections on a closed surface. So the, the space that uh, Thierry and Bott were determining the Betty numbers of, uh, we saw had a symplectic structure and the volume using the volume form of that symplectic structure involves the multiplicative structure of the cohomology, not just the Betty numbers. So this was one way of viewing uh, this particular aspect of the multiplicative structure in this format of a, uh, of a topological quantum field theory. So it's a, it, it doesn't uh, prove, prove, it gives you a, a way of organizing material there's a lot of work that, uh, that goes into it. So anyway, that's, that is uh, really probably quite familiar work. So, so what happened? Well, this was all going on in the 1980s. And in 1990, uh, Fields medals were awarded uh, that the selection committee included Fadea and Atia. And as you see, uh, Witten, Vaughan Jones and Drinfeld and Maury got them, but it was said at the time that there were three quantum fields medals and one mathematical one. So this was a this was a stage at which you could say that the interaction of physics and into mathematics had really had really arrived. Uh, but uh, a few years later, there was uh, there was some hesitation about whether this was a good thing or not. So there was this uh, letter by Jaffe and Quinn, which created a certain amount of controversy. Um, as you see, uh, traditional, what they say is that recent interactions between physics and mathematics pose a question with some force. Traditional mathematical norms discourage speculation, but it is the fabric of theoretical physics. So this letter uh, generated uh, a very vigorous response, and I encourage you to, uh, to read it. So here, for example, is Atiyah's response. Uh, his fundamental objection is that they present a sanitized view of mathematics, which condemns the subject to an arthritic old age. And the, uh, the marvelous formulae emerging at present from heuristic physical arguments are the modern counterparts of Euler and Ramanujan and they should be accepted in the same spirit of gratitude, tempered with caution. So um, I encourage you to, to read, uh, to look at, look at the other responses. For example, here's Borel saying that uh, he thought he understood Cartan's point of view, but uh, Cartan's work, but then he realized later he didn't, but he, he argues for the self-correcting power of mathematics that uh, Mandelbrot, as you see, his, uh, his objection to the letter is that in their search for credit for some individuals at the expense of others, they consider rogues. They propose to set up a police state within Charles mathematics and a world cop beyond its borders. So Charles is the river Charles. So this is, uh, this is you guys, I'm afraid. Um, and Schwartz, of course, discusses the issues about uh, rewards for this, about which, where, where should the credit lie? Should it lie within the rigorous uh, final work or should it, rely, should it lie in the, uh, in the <coughs> speculative, speculative aspects that opens the whole thing up? So there was a lot of controversy uh, uh, about this, but it, which settled down and I think the letter was probably deliberately provocative in order to generate this, uh, this reaction. Anyway, during this time, you might say, what did, uh, what did Atiyah do apart from his uh, interactions with physicists, about from the challenges that he posed, apart from uh, explaining to mathematicians some of the ideas, what, what mathematics did he do which related to, to the physics. And I think, I think it's, uh, he had a, 
an attraction to things, never mind that these were nonlinear partial differential equations, uh, that somehow the particle nature, the sort of nonlinear particle nature of them was something which he was particularly uh, in, interested in. And so in the last part of this talk, um, let me just mention, point out four different aspects of his, his actual work, his papers, where it seems to me that uh, that particles, the notion of particles, no matter that they, this is these are not just linear superpositions of particles. These are particles which interact in a non-linear way. Uh, that there's a certain attraction uh, that he has for them. So fundamentally, I think for him, physics is still about localized objects uh, like particles, which nevertheless uh, live inside some non-linear uh, picture. So let me let me begin by begin by going back to those instant on moduli spaces. So once they were seen to exist, and once we knew what their dimension was, the obvious question is what what is the topology of a moduli space of instantons on the four sphere of charge k? So Atiyah's first venture into this this area uh, used these. Uh, Pseudo, the first examples, these tough examples, these pseudo particle solutions. Because what did they, apart from these uh, scalars here, what, what did they depend on? These k distinct points in R4. So this is the configuration space of k distinct points in R4. And this has been studied by, uh, by Graham Siegel uh, earlier in relation to its homotopy theory. And so the idea is this that if you look at the if you take this one over r squared potential, look at the, uh, the field it generates, the gradient. You can think of that as a map from the sphere, the four sphere to the four sphere, because the field uh, dies off at infinity. So it maps infinity in R4 to zero. And it's singular at the origin, so it maps zero into infinity. So it's, uh, it's a map from, we can think of it as a map from the compactification of R4 by one point to the compactification by R4. So there's a map from the configuration space of K points into the base maps of degree K from four to four. Okay, so from uh, S4 to S4. Now, if you look at the, in the world of connections, if you look at all connections, frame connections on R4, modulo gauge equivalents, then that's homotopic. You can use the radial, radial gauge to, to show this to the maps from the three sphere into SU2, which is itself is the three sphere. So it's, it's the maps from uh, S3 to S3. And there's another thing you can do. You can take the one instant on solution on the four sphere. You can pull it back by a degree k map to a, uh, and then you, you, and then go. So, so you can look and then get a map from here into this, uh, into this space here. So, uh, so there's a, a map here from, uh, from the configuration space into this space, into this space. And what, what Jones uh, and, uh, uh, Tia show is that this factors through MK. So the, these Toft solutions, these pseudo particle solutions, they they go as they go into the uh, into the moduli space of instantons. The moduli space of instantons uh, goes into this uh, space of all connections modulo gauge equivalents. Then up to homotopy, there's uh, this factors through through MK, and there's a, a deduction from that which is that this is actually, there's a homotopy equivalence through a certain dimension, which was not made precise then, but uh, much later using different techniques was, was given a precise, precise figure. So somehow uh, the topology of this uh, space of all connections modulo, which I'll put it another way, the topology of the moduli space of instantons of charge K, uh, Contains a lot of the uh, the cohomology of the of the full space of connections modulo gauge equivalence up to a certain level. So the particle aspect of instantons is is kind of present in its in the topology of the moduli space. 
So here's another example. So this involves uh, the study of uh, magnetic monopoles that uh, I spent some, several years on. So in this case, this is a gauge theory over R3. And you now have, you have a connection over in a bundle over R3, and you have a Higgs field, which is a section of a bundle of Lie algebras. The length of the Higgs field tends to one as you go off to infinity. And there's a degree here, uh, uh, there's a charge K, which is determined by this, this map at infinity from a large two sphere to the two sphere in SU2. And the equations which you're solving, which are analogous to the, uh, to the self julian mills equations, in fact, there are a special case of solutions uh, under dimensional reduction, but different boundary conditions, of course. Uh, these are given by these, uh, these Bogomolny equations. And as physicists, as usual, gave a, an example, uh, a spherically symmetric example, the BPS monopole. So uh, the work of, of Donaldson uh, showed that um, you could express the moduli space of monopoles as a space of uh, rational maps, maps, holomorphic maps from P1 to P1 of degree K, where K is the charge, which take uh, infinity into zero. So in other words, these are rational functions uh, <coughs> where the, uh, of, degree, of degree K. So the numerators of degree K minus one, and we have a monic polynomial on the base uh, underneath, which is uh, uh, begins with, okay, Z to the K. So a charge one instanton, a charge monopole, sorry, a charge one monopole is expressed by uh, uh, a, a rational map of this form. So we can think of this as a non-zero complex number, A and a complex number B, and which is, uh, so we can think of this as U1 cross R3, which is, a, you think of this as a position in R3 and a phase. So. A charge one instanton is to be thought of as a uh, something like a point particle together with uh, a phase, which is in, in U1. So now in general, uh, suppose we have uh, K distinct roots, suppose the denominator has K distinct roots. Then since this is a degree K, the numerator doesn't vanish at any of these roots. And so we get, uh, uh, k unordered points in, well, if we order, it's k unordered points in C star cross C, or C cross C star, which is the same as U1 cross R3. So again, uh, we're thinking here of uh, particle type objects, points in U1 cross R3 uh, uh, for different points. And so, but, uh, but on, the, on the other hand, the rational maps, we can have uh, equality of roots of the denominator. And so, so the, the rational maps is a, a resolution of the symmetric product of C star cross C. So, so this is, uh, so, so what, uh, what Atiyah uh, did was basically say the following, that in algebraic geometry, <clears throat> if you have a complex surface, then the obvious way of resolving uh, the symmetric product is to take the Hilbert scheme the ideal sheaves of, uh, of, of the dimension of the quotient is, is n. And he introduced this notion of a transverse Hilbert scheme. If your surface has a map to C, a projection to C, then you look at a sub, sub variety of the Hilbert scheme, subspace, open subspace, given by the ones which are, where this is a, an isomorphism onto the scheme theoretic image. In other words, that the, the image consists of uh, n points with multiplicities. Actually, Bielowski recently has shown that this is, even though the ordinary Hilbert scheme is singular in dimensions higher than two, this is actually smooth even in the dimension lengths uh, greater than two. So from this point of view, the rational maps are actually isomorphic to this transverse Hilbert scheme of C star cross C. So this is a, a so he used this, so we, we wrote a book together about magnetic monopoles and he used this as a, a way of constructing the twister space for the hyperkähler metric uh, out of the configuration space of, of points in C cross C star, the natural resolution via the transverse Hilbert scheme. So although it's the space of rational maps, you can you have a more intrinsic notion of, uh, 
of uh, it's this resolution in terms of uh, in terms of this transverse Hilbert scheme, which is I mean, which is very 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 nice. Um, why did he want so? Okay, so why did he want to use this for the hyperkähler metric? Well, this follows discussions with Manton on scattering of BPS monopoles and uh, the so the low energy dynamics are supposed to be described by geodesics on the moduli space and in this uh, so the challenge was to actually find the four dimensional moduli space four real dimensional moduli space corresponding to the centered two monopoles these are the rational maps that do it and to find geodesics on it and then so then we had this collaboration with I, IBM, which I don't know whether people have seen this, these pictures recently. So th this is one of the, the dynamics of two monopoles which came out of this. So this was produced 35 years ago. So clearly the, uh, the quality of the picture is not up to current computer standards. Anyway, what you saw there was uh, two monopoles uh, two monopoles coming in and interacting in a nonlinear fashion and scattering off in different directions. So I think what interested uh, Michael was the way in which the, when these were close together, the particle uh, characteristic disappeared. And uh, so, he, he worked with various people on producing uh, pictures of uh, symmetric monopoles to, to see what, how, um, to understand how particle-like objects could uh, coalesce in, in a nonlinear, nonlinear fashion. So that led also to work on skirmions, um, which this is uh, another interesting uh, issue. Uh, so, but, so as you see, the, the skirmions, uh, the symmetric skirmions, so basically their energy densities, densities accumulate in the same way as symmetric monopoles. So somehow I think what, uh, what came out of this was a, a realization that the actual particular model, whether it was a monopole or a skirmion or whatever, that this, uh, this, the actual uh, behavior of these energy densities was somehow model independent when you had this coalescence. Okay, so finally, uh, in the last couple of minutes, um, there's a problem which he addressed, which is again related to particles in a different fashion, that was given to him uh, at the time that he was, uh, he'd given up his uh, administrative jobs as uh, president of the Royal Society and uh, master of Trinity College, Cambridge. And this was the question of, can you find a natural map between the configuration space of points, distinct points in R3 and the flag manifold UN over T. So the symmetric group acts permuting the points here, the labeling of the points, and it acts here as the vial group. And uh, he gave one solution and a conjecture in this, in this paper. Uh, he did, it was it was unhappy with the solution, I think, because it uh, it broke the symmetry of the problem. The conjecture, which is here, as a particular way of uh, trying trying to get this uh, isomorphism, this was uh, this was the one he hung on to for a long time, with, and a lot of numerical evidence, but it uh, it never actually, as far as I know, there's no proof that this necessarily works. Now, on the other hand, there is. A much more, to me, much more interesting and uh, general problem, which relates this to uh, not just the symmetric group, but to the vial group of simple Lie group. And uh, the resolution of this, in the paper with Roger Bielaski, involves norms, norms equations. So these are gauge theoretic equations. Um, but uh, one of the things which uh, Sir Michael always uh, liked was the, he liked to have a proof which was consistent with the elegance of the problem and I think neither his first solution nor this uh, this one involving norms equations really conformed to that uh, that point of view. 
so these these kind of particle related uh, works uh, I think it reflected the fact that uh, he was very happy to see the influence of mathematics in uh, in physics and physics in mathematics uh, but that uh, there were two different ways of, of viewing that there was what we've seen before was the what he called the market force model and some of his work that we've seen uh, conforms to that but his alternative was this that somehow mathematicians are gardeners breeding new species and the physicists are more like the modern version of the 19th century collectors who went across the world searching for exotic specimens to reinvigorate our gardens. And I think there's something of both in his work, but I have a suspicion that it's the second point of view which he really adhered to. So now, uh, so thank you. I think uh, I've come to the end of my time now. So let's all virtually over Zoom thank Nigel for a wonderful talk. Um, the question answer, uh, box is, is open for you to uh, ask questions um, but um, I very much like to thank Nigel for what was a surprisingly deep view into the world of Michael Lettier and the mathematics and physics that, that he influenced. I had a question actually about the theorem of Noah Simon and Sashadri which um, you described as being reset in the Lettier bot work. Um, the Noah Simon and Sashadri paper was in mid 60s perhaps early yeah. 60s and a tier bot was 80s um maybe 1980 was the first short version of their paper um, yes was there a time in the intervening 15 years where because it wasn't really said in the language of gauge theory that came later that somehow people had forgotten the narrow simmons shardy work at least those people in in the gauge theory world had sort of ceased to be aware of it yeah, um, no, that's that's an interesting point. I mean, I think uh, I think Bot had been visiting the Tata Institute, and that was one of the reasons why, when he got in touch with Michael, that they started working on this. Um, I think it was one of those things where Michael liked to talk to people all the time, and uh, if they'd been somewhere, he'd say, well, you know, what are they working on over there? And then at the same time, he, he was interested in gauge theory and they decided to put these things together. But that's a, that's a very good point. Um, I mean, when you look, at, in fact, when you look at now Simon Sachadri's paper, I don't think there's, there's probably no mention of the word connection, you know? So, so for them, for them, it's, uh, you know, representation of the fundamental group or local, local system perhaps, but the actual word connection is not, is not really, really in there. And I think, uh, I think this is uh, it's a difference of language, and but uh, these things are in some respects lost, missed opportunities. Uh, it, it's true. I mean, just as if you like the uh, looking at the the boundary of the hyperbolic space, perhaps should have suggested other things uh, about the use of gauge there, which which uh, Simon uh, latched onto. There's two questions there in the Nigel. Can you can you see the question and answer box? Yeah, yeah, I can see. Them. Okay, I can see them now. Yes, yes. So there's one here about who do I consider most influential mathematicians bringing maths and physics together nowadays, and which in which areas is the interaction most fruitful? My gosh, there's so much going on nowadays, isn't there? Um, I think you know Edward Witten is is still the person that uh, I think brings the most interesting. I think he's the person who understands mathematicians and physicists better than most. And uh, I think you know which areas is the interaction most fruitful. I think the fruit fruitfulness comes later on. I'm I've been interested for several years in in the. Uh, SYZ metasymmetry, the Langdon's duality, the work of uh, the consequences of the work of Kapustin and Witten, and it's it's kind of trying to find out what is really what is really happening underneath it all. Um, 
So I still think that, but you know, I'm, there's a younger generation as well, uh, which perhaps I'm less, less informed about. Uh, but it's, it's, it's always uh, wise to, I think, uh, listen to, to what Whitten is saying. Now, um, uh, there's, a paper, there's a question here from Marcos Jardim. Was Michael Atia involved in the development of the NAM transform of monopoles? Do I know where does the inspiration for the NAM transform come from, from physicists? Well, yes, I mean, so it, it came from NAM himself. Um, so I think, I think it was a, a question of adapting uh, into an infinite dimensional context something, some finite construction of instantons. So somehow, I, I mean, I remember very well uh, reading Nam's uh, preprint uh, when I was going down to Southampton on the train and uh, thinking, well, if he uses, uh, if he gets elliptic functions for the charge two monopole, and I can see the, uh, the spectral curve of a charge two monopole involving elliptic uh, curves, then this must be the, uh, this must be a, a common ground. So, so where does, I think, I think basically Nam actually, yes, okay. So the answer is yes, it certainly came from physicists, from, from Nam. And I think he was integrating out over the reals, something which perhaps over in the discrete case of, uh, of instantons was a sum, a summation. I, I think that was that was basically it. And I think he he started with uh, one monopole and then then adapted it. But my memory escapes me now. And perhaps stepping slightly into the unknown, I wonder how Nam himself became interested in monopoles and to what extent that was influenced. Perhaps as it must have been through. Um, the work that's been coming out of a tier and on. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Um, yeah, of course. Then the norm, the norm equations, of course, became completely independent of monopoles. You, Peter, yourself, of course, used the you used them in constructing hypercalar uh, metrics. So, uh, so it's it kind of became detached from monopoles completely. Good. If there aren't any other questions, I'd really like us all to thank Nigel, however we can, through Zoom, uh, one more time for a wonderful exposition um, and a very enjoyable morning here in the Boston area, um, afternoon or evening or midnight, wherever. Uh, <laughs> so, um, it's a great talk, Nigel. I really enjoyed okay. it. Okay. Okay. It's nice to see you all as well. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Okay. Bye then. Okay, I hope to see you sometime soon, yeah, somewhere. Yeah, sure, sure. Before long, I hope. Yeah, okay. Yeah, bye. Bye. <laughs>